And so this whole theme, all week long, I've been sitting on this word and talking to God. And I'm like, what is all this about? You know, the other thing when you go to the beach that you catch and release, I don't know about y'all, but my kids cannot wait to get the flashlights out at night. And I'm telling you, we were up in our, we were on the third floor of this place and I'm looking out the window and you see flashlights, I mean lightnings coming across the sky and you see flashlights. You know, all across the beach, like, they're going to find a million dollars. No, we're just looking for these sand crabs. (laughs) And you hear screaming all over the place because if you're not careful, that sand crab will run right across your foot. And, you know, and that's what I do. So I wear my shoes down there. I don't care. So what do you do with the sand crab? You catch it and you release it. You don't want to keep it. It's there for your enjoyment, for you to have. And are they, do they multiply after you release it? Yes, you have a bunch more that come after that one. Catch and release. It just kept coming. When I'd wake up in the mornings, the beach, you know, one thing I love about the setting there is you don't know what you're going to wake up to. The water is always hitting that sand and that shore and reshaping everything. That's the next photo. So some mornings we would wake up and we had this pool in front of us, like just a a natural pool that the kids could just waller in and not worry about big sharks being in it because it was cut off from the rest of of the water. And then some days you'd wake up and the waves would be crashing and you didn't even want to get in. But it was constant change, catching and releasing, catching and releasing. And lastly, I had Cade bring some of this right here. Uh, there were these two boys playing baseball on the beach. And it was so funny. One of them, was, he looked like he was like nine, but he said he was about turn 13. And his big brother. And they were just throwing this ball across. You're left-handed. Is this a left? Oh, no, you're supposed to wear that on the left hand. Come here, Kay, catch it. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Be like, oh, there went the drum cage. But they were just catching and releasing, catching and releasing. And they were catching the attention of all these, you know, these men that knew baseball. And, you know, and that's what you do right there. What if somebody just kept the ball in a game? Are you going to win the game? You got to catch and catch and release. And thank you guys. And you're, <laughs> they're like, we could do this for days. Y'all could go over there in a corner and do it while I preach. It's no problem. <laughs> and you know, my husband's up there going, hey, are you a submarine um, pitcher? And that little, yeah, yeah, I didn't know what that was either. And that little boy goes, yeah. And you know, and he's throwing that ball a special way. And Jason's over there edifying him going, man, you're good. That's unique talent. <laughs> Just building him up. But that catching and that releasing, I mean, I'm telling you, it was just a constant theme. You know, in the spirit and in the walk with Christ, the catch and releases are number one, you got to own nothing and steward everything. If you want to keep a steady flow of the presence of God and your relationship fresh with God, just don't own anything, just steward it. That way, when the enemy comes and he tries to stir you up, trying to take something away, no, you didn't take nothing from me. It's God's. You know, when you have children, you got to give those children back to God. When you get possessions or riches, you got to trade that back to God. Just let it keep flowing out of you guys. That's why generosity, when you are generous, you'll never run out. There's a scripture, actually, Proverbs 11.25, if you want to write that down or look at it and take notes. Go back and look at this. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. So how do we catch and release? Number one, own nothing, steward everything. Number two, keep it moving. Keep it moving. Sometimes we get with Christ, and we get in recliner mode. We're like, this feels good. Okay, 
I'm here. I'm, I'm in a church. I'm, I'm even attending regularly. I have my Bible. I've done a few devotions. And what you really end up doing, you find yourself sitting and settling. You have to challenge yourself to go closer and closer to God, giving more and more of yourself and keep it moving. If you only do what's comfortable, you'll never grow. And God wants us to grow. He wants us to keep moving. Seasons of life change. You got to keep moving. You can't get sad because all the kids are gone. You got to keep moving. You can't build altars around stationed things of this world. We have to stay with God, and God is always moving. He's, he's not back there thinking about the garden. He's looking to the future. When am I going to send my son? Come on. He is alive, breathing, moving. The only things that are not moving are the things that are dead. And here's the thing. A good church isn't going to make you grow. A good pastor isn't going to make you grow or change or do anything. Okay, Jesus has already done all the work, so the responsibility lies on me. I have to choose to get up and pray. I have to choose to jump in there. I have a lot of people that will come to church over the years, and they'll say, I just didn't feel connected. But I've watched them, and they refuse to connect. They want everybody to go sit next to their recliner and connect with them. That's not how it works. You have to put forth the effort. Amen. If you're going to date somebody, you can sit there and wish they were dating you, or you could go knock on the door and say, hey, would you like to go on a date? Amen. Activation is where it's at. Take hold of your salvation. Declare this is mine and I'm going for it. I'm going to tell you right now too, even if finances have been an obstacle of why you're not following the call of God on your life, God's waiting on you to step out and then he'll provide. You see, because faith, <laughs> amen, faith is not by what we see. Faith is the invisible that I see by my spirit man. Ooh, hallelujah. Number three, catch and release. Release in the right field in the correct timing. You know, that's really what leaders are for. It's kind of like that's what parents are for. If you've got some good, loving parents, they've always tried to help you do things not only that are good, okay, but do it in the right place in the right timing. And that's what... The church is really the leaders are there for. You know, we, we're not made to be on our own. You know, I love Keith Collins wrote me and Pastor Jason this morning. And I'm going to read what you, you know, this is him being a father to us. He's our friend, but he is such a spiritual father. He said, good morning, Jason and Kim. As our nation celebrates Independence Day and freedom to be, I'm believing that as you step into your place God has assigned you to today, remember your steps have been ordered and ordained by God. He's given us a high five. <laughs> and God, in his infinite wisdom and grace, created you for such a time as this. Today your voice will connect with those who hear you. Today your voice will be weighty with no words falling to the ground. Today the, he's prophesying over us. Today the presence of God will be sensed and divine backing will be experienced. I mean, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Lean into his presence. And then he gives us all these scriptures. I love he sent that, but I'm glad I didn't lay in bed and wait for it to come. Amen. Catch and release, catch and release. Matthew 13, that's going to be our main point of scripture this morning. Everybody say Matthew 13. 13 holds a, a, a kind place in my heart because I was born November 13th. Pastor Jason's August 13th. And we're both turning 50 this year. <laughs> Let's go celebrate. I'm excited. And some of our kids are 13. It's so weird. 13 just kind of rules through us. Josie's turning 13. Yeah. Two weeks. July 13th. She'll be 13. <laughs> it's crazy. I forgot about that. That's our girl that was singing up here. All right. Matthew 13. 
A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and did what? They ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Verse 7. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. We skip on down to verse 18 of Matthew 13, and, it, and Jesus says, Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Remember how many times I'm going to say the word understand it. Verse 20, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall away. Verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, not just a plant, a crop. Hmm. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what they have sown. Now, the word understand there doesn't mean that you mentally capture it. It means that you take it in, even if I read this right here. Next slide. Greek verb, which means to bring together, to set together. Understand also means to perceive, to hear, and to wrap your mind around it. As we would say, we put it all together when figuring something out. Y'all ever had an aha moment where it wasn't just that it clicked up here, but you're like, oh, like it's deep in here, everything, I get it. That's what it's talking about. That you not only hear the word, but you take the time to go, Oh, I meditated on it long enough that I get it. That's where you're going to produce a crop. Three things we need to catch in the age that we're living in, guys. Three things we need to catch. We have once again got to rise up as the church who acts on the word. You see, we have been steady as she goes, doing a mental evaluation of what lies ahead and not being trained up in our spirit, man, to step out spiritually in the unknown. Therefore, the church has not been making history because we're just following the path of safety. You see, nobody you read about in history took a road of safety. They took a road of risk. I love Lydia Morrow said, how do you spell faith? R-I-S-K every time. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K every time. There has to be a risk. I've risked so much, you don't even want to know. <laughs> okay? But I'm nobody special. I just one day woke up and I decided, man, I keep waiting. I keep, God, you give me vision and it just keeps sitting there. And what am I waiting on? Who is this affecting that I'm not stepping out? And it's all about your kingdom. So God, I'm going to step out. And if it comes out from under me, then I'm just in wrong timing. But at least I tried. You've got to carry that attitude if you're going to move and catch what we need in this generation. The second thing you're going to need is... We need a revival of mothers and fathers of the faith. Yes. Guys, whatever you do, don't be churchgoers. Become sons and daughters. Amen. It doesn't matter your age in this room. Become a son and a daughter. Amen. Now, I, I was praying over this this morning, and I realized we even say a lot of things like we are Victory Family Church. And some of you had a very disoriented family growing up. So... 
Step one is you've got to learn what God meant with family. Don't carry it in on the hills of what you've experienced. Think about it on the hills of what you read in the Word. Think about Noah, and he had three sons. And Noah didn't go out ambitiously and build this ark without them. God helped him to use his family, his wife, his son's wife, and all of them built it together. Now, the whole community could benefited from that had they been living right but but God's view of family is we minister together his view of family is there is a mom and there's a dad the devil hates it you know there's something that a male brings into a situation with with anything that is just a, a dynamic that is needed And if you're somebody in the room and you're not married, that's fine. Or if you're divorced or the husband was terrible and he's gone, fine. But find a spiritual father in the body of Christ that can come alongside your family and bring that other part that God intended because it's needed. Females, the ladies in the room. God doesn't want you to be not feminine to follow Christ. You don't have to be like a man. You're already a warrior. You birth another human. Be feminine. Be filled with the Spirit. It's not about your gender. It's about that you're obeying God. You know, you can fill a feminine role and still obey God. We need mothers and fathers. And and we need to learn what that is again. I'm going to tell you something. I grew up in a country church. And Mother Caraway, when she stood up, you knew it was on. She was on that second row. And there wasn't but two rows of pews up in that church. Wasn't that right, Mama? Mama stood up, you knew it was on. Because she didn't do that. But Sister Caraway, she'd stand up. And, and she just could not even contain the excitement and the zeal she had to testify that God is good. I mean, it was nothing new any other week, but God has been good to me. I woke up this morning. I walked in here today. It wasn't anything off the chart special any week of the month. But you knew when Sister Caraway stood up, she was going to give herself to the Spirit of God. And that might mean she danced across the front. Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Did y'all see that? My shoe just fell apart. Let's just take those off. Barefoot preacher Rich Mullins, here I come. Watch your words. (laughs) They'll manifest. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) But Sister Caraway, man, she carried this life. And her husband, we would count how many times in one testimony he could say glory to God. Because it was like, God's been good to me, glory to God. And I know that the future is good, glory to God. And, and me and my little teenage friends, we just count how many times can he say glory to God. <laughs> However you say it, be, be that with the Lord. <laughs> but we need mothers and fathers. Third thing, we need to know the anointing, catch it and release it. I have something really special. I hope that... Reagan got it and can put it up here, but I sent it to all of my kids that had phones. And I'm going to share, I was, I got my dad's Bible up here. My dad and mother ministered for 63 years. And um, dad, if you don't know, he would do healing meetings. He was, um, from the time him and mother got married, when they got married was when he got saved, just about. And mom and him got saved in a little country church off the prayers of so many people. But my um, Aunt Bessie Lee was standing at the door. She prayed and ran my dad down. Every time she saw him, she would chase him down and say, Raymond, if you give your life to Jesus and you'll tithe, God will bless you. My dad had no idea at that beginning what that would truly mean. But dad, I could go on and on about him and mother. And this weekend, dad's been gone for almost five years. But this weekend would have been, what, your anniversary, July 2nd? 68 years. So happy anniversary still, mom. 
And so dad's been gone, but the legacy has not been gone. And I was looking through his Bible. I spent the night with mama the other night and, and we were going through closets and we found, um, dad's jacket. Who remembers Johnny Carson? This is a Johnny Carson suit <laughs> that the Reverend R.E. Dean wore, okay? He's got Johnny Carson in the pocket, you know. But I, gra I told Mom, I said, bring that suit today. <laughs> bring, that, bring that coat. But the legacy, do you have that letter, Reagan? Oh, she's not back there. Okay, I'll read it to you guys. Um, what I sent to everybody in our family, but I was going through dad's Bible Hold on sorry Let me let me find it because it was precious and it's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to impart it into you Dad had a sixth grade education He dropped out of school, but he did he did walk for miles from just about where my mother lives, um, which is close to Highway 84, to go to Pinkard, Alabama to go to school because going to school was an honor and a privilege. And he would leave his family, which put his family in a lot of turmoil because my granddaddy was a farmer. And unless my, you know, my granddaddy's children were there, no one could help harvest what was needed. So dad did have to uh, jump out of school at sixth grade and he so he barely learned to read and write but this note right here in his handwriting he was preparing and he said the anointing power and it says when I start talking that me myself when the anointing comes I step out and the anointing steps over I'm not, I'm not the same. What the anointing does, and, and I didn't get to look at this, but he put 1 Chronicles 16 through 22. Tough, not my anointing. It's tough when it's not his anointing. And it said, Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Will the son find faith in the earth when he returns? And then it says, return, he will find faith in the earth. You will, uh, possible, nothing is impossible. And then I'm trying to read that bottom one. Dear, the message, I want you to see the goodness, 2005. And his Bible has just got all of this, this goodness in it and these notes. And, you know, and I was just thinking he's trying to relay and something, y'all, I can't even, I, I can tell you about it. But unless you trust what I'm saying, you can't have it. Because if you mentally try to get it, it's not there. But the anointing, you are called to live under the anointing. It makes it where it's not you who lives, but it is Christ who lives in you, the hope of glory. But the only, the reason we don't hear about the anointing is because the anointing comes at a cost. Salvation is free, but the anointing is at a cost. Okay? The anointing is the oil that stays in your lantern. How do you get it? How, what are you going to do? You're going to pray. And you're gonna, it's going to cost you your time. Amen. That's not a big cost, is it? You're going to have to also not be owned by anything in this world. You've got to leave those philosophies of this world that you see about you, yourself, and I. You got to stop living for the next paycheck and live for the next breath you take in God. And then out of that, you have to begin what he pours into you, begin to pour it out. And walk in this anointing. But I'm going to tell you something else, my friends. Some things that cannot be taught have to be caught. And the way you're going to catch it, my friends, is you're going to have to get up under the people who are flowing in the anointing. 
You're, you, you know, it, it's not about material things, but it is certainly about a right place, a right time. And if you stay with the anointing, you're going to catch it. But if you decide to lay back, lay off, not be with God, not spend time with God, then you are going to miss it. It is no different. Come here, Kay, throw that ball again. Have you ever gone to a professional baseball game? And have you ever seen when somebody, here you go, decided to look at their phone rather than watch the game? And all of a sudden, the baseball, stand up over here, Daddy. You know, you know. Oh, oh, he's creaking some. He didn't stretch this morning. Look, they got to keep looking at each other to catch this ball. And all of you are looking at it too. Because you don't want the ball to swing over there. Look at, we look like we're in a tennis match. All right, thank you. That's what I mean about staying with God under the flow of the anointing. You can't take this break in this time. Do you hear me? You can't get distracted. You're being tested right now to be distracted. Don't be distracted. Stay under the anointing. You say, I don't know what the anointing is, but it sure looks good. You better hang around somebody who knows what it is. And I'm telling you, it just begins to ooze off of you. Because I can't teach you something, but I can, I can show an example of it. And it's not mine to give. It is the anointing of the Lord. He's our source. Raiding was just a man. But the way he wore God on his life, that's what made the miracles happen. That's what made things change. And we are settling too much for what's right there in front of us, looking at what we can see with our bare eye. What are you clothed in, my friend? Because the clothing is invisible. The things that are worth living for are things that you can't see yet. But you pray into existence. Hallelujah. It's just what we must do. 1 Corinthians 2, 13 through 15. If we start at verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm reading out the Christian Standard Bible. It says, we also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it's foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it's evaluated spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can evaluate everything, yet he himself cannot be evaluated by anyone. If you're weird in the room, stay weird. It's okay they can't understand it. I mean, I hate to repeat this story, but it was one of the most remarkable times in my life when I came on an accident. And, 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 and worldly people driving an ambulance came to the scene, and a man had died, and I prayed, and he came back to life. But that, wasn't, that was a kicker, but that was not the kicker. The kicker was that the world knew that I carried something of faith. And they had to, the ambulance workers had to come back and get me and say, whatever it is you're praying, I need you to come with me so that we don't lose him. Because every time you walk away, we start to lose him. 
So I walked up this hill on the interstate and I just began to do what I had no idea what was going on. If I had knowledge of it, I would be God. But I just decided, let me be like a little child. Let me not understand what's going on. But yes, Lord, whatever you say, what my spiritual father did, so I will do because I see the fruit and the fruit is not dead religion. The fruit is people are being raised from the dead. Oh my goodness. Those that are asleep are coming alive. I'm seeing people gather that are changed, that the chains are breaking off. Addiction is being broken. Drugs and alcohol have no authority over this Jesus. And I decided myself was a testimony. I was lost, but now I found. I was blind, but now I see. And guys, it's getting churned up in America. It's getting churned up all over the world. And we are needed. No more time to sit on the sidelines. No more time to be watching the game and then glancing at your phone. You gotta be ready to catch the anointing and release it. And that's where we are. And you can't catch it if you're just smart enough to catch it. No, no education required, no degree needed. No seminary needed. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. I'm telling you, one of the greatest evangelists that's ever walked the earth, Joe Oden, who is raising up his family to do the same. That, that young man was appointed by the courts to go to revival because of a godly judge in Mobile, Alabama. They didn't know what they were doing. Joe didn't know what was about to happen, but Joe's first evangelistic trip going to Walmart was not that he knew the theology of Genesis all the way to Revelation. It wasn't that he belonged to a certain denomination. It was that he heard somebody say, get old up and go and tell people the good news of Jesus. So Joe and his little buddy, they went and got them a quart of vegetable oil. And they poured it all over their head until they were drenched in oil. And they prayed for hours. And then they said, okay, it's time to go to Walmart. And they walked through Walmart and oil was just dripping all over the floor. All over the floor. And they didn't know what they were doing. But God was looking down going, I can use that one. Joe had found a love that took the place and was greater than any high on drugs he had known. We can't have any lesser lovers in this time, y'all. It has to be Jesus. And you say, I'm just an ordinary Christian. I just came here today trying to find a good church. Well, God had other plans for you. You were brought here by God. You're watching this online by God. It's time for the churches that know God to look like they know God. You see, if you look back in Genesis and Exodus, God invited the people to come up the mountain with Moses. Come on up and see the Lord. And they said, oh, no, no, we're going to stay right here. You come tell us what he said. Those days are over. You don't need to recycle what the preacher says. You need to get in the prayer closet and hear for yourself what God says. The veil has been torn, guys. We no longer live in a temple made by hands anyway. The Bible said that the Spirit of the Lord lives in us, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And we're just going to make it to heaven? No. We're going to see revival. We're going to catch and release what God has given to us so freely. We're going to give it away. I'm almost done. Why are we going to do this? Why? That's the, it's a big old screen back there that says why. We got it. Yeah, there we go. Why? Why should you care? Why should it be you? Why am I preaching this with sweat dripping down my brow? 
Why? For 20-something years, has the God who visited me as a 24-year-old alcoholic hiding everything from my parents? He saved my soul. Why after all these years when all my friends didn't understand and left me? And I was sitting there as just me and mom and dad. Why? Why do we care so much that we preach this? Why? <laughs> well, one reason is... <laughs> John 6 said the spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. So what if you don't grab hold of this and you walk through this whole life and you could have led somebody to this freedom and you just didn't. And you get to the end of life and it counts for nothing. Your existence isn't even remembered. Because when I get to heaven... I might be sad when you die here, but when I get to heaven, I'm, I'm not going to remember you because you're somewhere else. And there's no tears in heaven. God doesn't desire that. He didn't make hell for you. He didn't make hell for me. Hell is not supposed to be the human's destination. The Bible clearly says that hell was made for the fallen angels and Lucifer. The rebellious angel of heaven who is now roaming the earth trying to get you away from your destination and your destiny. Amen. You see, your destiny is what happens from now until you expire, okay? If you follow Christ. But your destination is supposed to be not only going to heaven, but taking as many people with you. Now, you can't save them, but I'm asking you, are you handing out invitations? Is it, I know, I know you witness to people. I know you pray for people, and you don't see them turn and look in any way like they're going to come to church or Jesus or anything. But your job is to put the seed in the ground. Generously. I've had people tell me I've never seen somebody healed, and I ask them, how many people have you prayed for? You see, you can't pray for one people a, a year and think you're going to see something. You've got to make this a consistent walk with Christ that you catch and release. Catch and release. You don't even have to pray for somebody and stand there and see if something happens. You just pray for them, and then you keep moving. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father. The faith is here to heal. Believe right now. Heal his body. Amen. Catch and release. Catch and release. Catch and release. What's got you bogged down today? What's got your attention? Where are you headed? Is it where God wants you to be? Because I'm going to tell you, there's some people in this room right now. We're moving them to the next career, but they're supposed to be in ministry. I'm going to tell you right now, the cares of this world has taken over some of your lives. And the seed is trying to grow. But you can't let it grow because you are bombarded with this need to survive. I would rather die. For the gospel than try to survive living normal. And I felt it strong in my spirit this morning. You think that everything in your life is going to happen on your own willpower. That you are the provider. That you're you got that much power to sink or to float that boat. But what you're going to do is you're going to get to the end. You're going to realize the spirit gives life and the flesh counts for nothing. And what am I bringing with me to present to my king? He's given me everything. What is it that I would hold on to? So that's one why. The next why, why should you care? You may be one decision away from being a weed or a plant. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there's some people, even under the sound of my voice, that you've been dragging it along. And the people in your life are trying to love Jesus. They're trying to pray. But you keep doing something else. 
And it's your attention is not on God. So what's happening is you're, you're dragging it along and what you're becoming, because what the weed does is planted there, but it comes up and it holds back the growth of another plant. And then the weeds eventually overtake. I've rarely seen a household of people come to Christ because one person got their life together when everybody else was dragging backwards. I know that's a solemn word. I know that. We should weep because there's people that you're trying to lead to Christ. I get it. And it gets lonely. And not everybody's on the same page, whether it's your house, whether it's your workplace or your school or the gym you go to or the, you know, the, uh, the streets, wherever, the church. Amen. Can you imagine if we all decided to be planted and rooted and going for it 100% on our own? What would happen? Don't evaluate that. Catch that with your spirit. You're called. You're anointed. If you're at a job because God sent you there and it's your mission, I'm going to announce to you, let, let's do that. Let's do that full throttle. But if you're going to get a job because you got to just do something, and it seems like the next thing, but you know God's calling you to full-time do something for Christ, whether it's work on the mission field or, or work in a church or, or you know, uh, an outreach. And you got to obey God, whether anybody understands it or not. And I'm going to tell you, there are some people that are distinguished and called to work a secular job and absolutely fund the kingdom. It is an honor to do that. I pray to the good Lord Jason and I one day, and he works a secular job too, that we can live on 20 and that we can give the rest. Hallelujah. Okay. Matthew 13, 24 says this. We're still in Matthew 13. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Jesus is still on this idea of the seed, okay? He's just summarizing what he was saying. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds all appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull up those weeds? Look at what happens here. No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. Guys, a consequence of not listening today. You may not know you're a weed among plants, among a harvest. If you don't take time today to listen to this word and evaluate where you've been in your words, your speech, your actions, I think it's gonna, we're going to answer more for the sin of omission than we will ever answer for the sin of committing sins. Consequence, wherever you're headed, someone is following And the question is, where are you leading them? I love this last thing that I found. Catch and release, catch and release, catch and release. Put that last slide up for me, please. This guy right here, I didn't know who he was. I just happened to find this quote. But come to find out, he's a pro football player. Do y'all know Adrian Peterson? I love his little thing he said right here. He said, my dad means a lot to me. He's the one who first put a football in my hands. I'm about to be 50. And I know that doesn't seem old to some of you. But I'm telling you, the whole mode I'm in is I need to put a ball in your hands. And I need you to catch it. And I need you to get up and come on. That's the mode I'm in. 
This is spiritually caught, not physically taught. And it's not, I'm not saying you're not doing enough. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying this isn't a good church. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is don't back off the fire. Who's lighting your fire, your passion for Christ? Don't back off the fire. I'm telling you, if someone in your house is not on fire, you got to stay on fire. Because if you both get off the fire, what's going to happen? There's going to be no hope. Who's on fire? You've got to catch the ball. You, you want to know? I promise you the devil does not fight you about going out to eat. I promise you he doesn't fight you about going to a ball game. I promise you, he would not fight you about going seeing the 4th of July fireworks. Did anybody have a, a big fight doing any of this stuff? No? No internal, I should stay home. I don't feel good. You've got to begin to see in the spirit your enemy. Your enemy is always working to lure you away from being strengthened by the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. We are the body. We are the body. Together, we are the body. It's not good for a hand to stay at home alone. I needed that hand. You know, it's not good for some shoulders to stay alone. They need to be connected to the body or that'd be weird. Whatever part you are, it's not meant for us to operate alone. Can you imagine a hand running off by itself? But in the more we connect, the more we find our function and it's not as laborsome. Don't let the enemy talk you out of fellowship. As a matter of fact, you ought to just step on the enemy's toe and say, I'm about to have people at my house. We're going to have a prayer meeting. I'm about to do this. And you got to do it. Maybe sometimes, look, I love the strength of don't say a thing and just do it. You don't have to announce it. Just do it. Just go after God. Go after God. Catch the ball and release it. Will you stand to your feet and just begin to pray with me right now? Just begin to pray all over this room. All, everybody watching online, just begin to pray. Pray, pray, pray that the Lord of the harvest, pray for, for revelation. God, show me, show me whatever was said today, God, what I am supposed to take in. God, show me the power of your word. Worship team, would you please um, come up? Lord, show me. I want prophetic worship. I want to hear what y'all been playing and singing in your secret place. That's what I want. I, I don't want to show. We're not going to recycle today. We're going we're gonna to come from a place. Come on. We're going to come from a place. They didn't put on a show earlier, and I don't mean that. This, this right here is one of the most authentic worship teams I've ever seen or been a part of. They do worship in private. It is authentic, and I love y'all. But in this moment, get in your spirit, man. I believe today is the day that new beginnings are happening. I believe today is the day that you're getting cloaked. You know, Joseph, his dad gave him a coat of many colors. But even when that coat got torn up by his brothers and they lied to their dad saying that the, the animals had gotten Joseph, Joseph anointing did not end with the fabric of the coat because it was a spiritual anointing. You're anointed. Get under the anointing right now. Just lift your hands under the anointing of God, the presence of God. Come on, don't, get, don't let your flesh win. Don't let your vision be blurred. Wipe off your spiritual lens and say, God, I'm here for you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Come on, some of you need to get closer and just begin to worship.
get closer and just begin to worship. Some of you just stepping out of your pew to the right or to the left is going to be huge because you're taking action. You're not only hearing the word, but you're activating the word. You're acting on what you hear. You're saying, God, I'm present. God, I'm here. I don't want my life to count for nothing. I have to get spiritually minded. Come on, let's hear the heavens open. Let's believe right now if people who are called by his name would seek his face, repent of our sins, that he would come and he would heal our land. Come on, don't step back because you think you won't step up. You can't do it, but Jesus can. All he needs is your, your understanding, your willingness to put it all together. Perfect love cast out all fear. He is the perfect love. Come on, is anybody in the room? You want to give your life to Jesus right now? Anybody online? You want to give your life to Jesus? Make it count. Make it count. Today's the day of salvation.